The Christmas season is one that is filled with music. That is just a, a part of this holiday. Uh, you know, after Thanksgiving, all of a sudden, a quarter of the radio stations on your tuner are playing Christmas music instead of whatever they've been playing for the rest of the year. And some of you get really excited about that. I don't understand you. Okay. Uh, but it, it, is a, it is a time full of Christmas music. Maybe when you were decorating at your house and putting up your tree, you turned on some Christmas music. Maybe you asked Alexa or Google to do that for you, like we do at our house. Uh, I have heard All I Want for Christmas is You by Mariah Carey at least 20 times in the last two weeks. Are you guys with me? Right? It's, just, it's, it's a season of music. When we have our kids' Christmas program, they act out the Christmas story and, and even the crucifixion and resurrection today. But something that always happens in our Christmas story, in our Christmas program, no matter what, is our kids are singing songs. It's just a holiday of music. One fascinating thing that we learn when we look at the Christmas story in the Bible, in Luke 1, is that the Bible story about Christmas is full of songs. If you look in Luke chapters 1 and 2, that's what we're going to be reading from today if you want to open there in your Bibles, uh, you will see several indented sections of words. Um, and, and those are words written in a poetic structure. They are probably songs. And, and so the, the Christmas story is full of them. There are at least three songs, and depending on how you count, maybe five. Uh, but there are three indented sections there in, in Luke 1 and 2. And, and so this is, this is just a story of the Bible where, where it doesn't just tell us the facts. It doesn't just tell us who is where and when and what happens. It gives us these interruptions, these songs. It gives us a soundtrack to the story. Now, we started to look at Mary's song a couple weeks ago. That's where we're going to be again today. And that is in Luke chapter 1. It starts in verse 46. And so that's where we're going to start reading. Uh, we did the first uh, large portion of this yesterday. Also, if you want to read along with us, you can find the passage on the inside of your bulletin this morning as well. And so, so let's just read the song. We're going to be looking at the last two verses, but let's start from the beginning. In Luke 1, verse 46, we read, And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me, Mary, blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with many good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant, Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors." So this is, the, this is a song that comes from Mary when she visits her cousin Elizabeth and, uh, and after she has been told that she is going to give birth to the Savior. A feature of the beginning of the story is Mary's humility, her humbleness. She recognizes that God has worked through her, his humble servant. He's, she recognizes that God is, is working through lowly people. And in fact, he's using the lowly to... Bring down the powerful and the rich. So that's how the story starts. And like I said today, I want to look at the last two verses. We'll look at verse 54. At the end of Mary's song, she begins to speak about Israel. She tells us two really important things here as we listen to this first song of Christmas. In verse 54, Mary says, He, God, has helped his servant Israel remembering to be merciful. Israel is the people of God in the Bible. Uh, the story of the Bible is the story of Israel from Genesis 12 on all the way to Revelation 22. And what we learn at the Christmas story is that God is being merciful to Israel, which if you're familiar with the story of the Old Testament is something that is incredibly necessary. Because God's people... All through this story, from Abraham to Malachi in the Old Testament, were sinful. Almost at every opportunity they were given by God, they failed to live up to his law, his commands. They failed to be faithful in their relationship 
to him as their God. They constantly let God down. They constantly did what they weren't supposed to do. They were constantly disappointing the God that they were supposed to have a relationship with. And one of the incredible things about the Christmas story is that God isn't going to give up on them. One of the, the, the wonderful, one wonderful thing about the Christmas story is that God looked at this people who were sinful, who, who were disappointing, these people who had not fulfilled the role that God had given them, had not been living the life that God had designed for them to have, and, and God says, I'm going to be merciful to you, and I'm going to help you. Those aren't just words. Those become reality on Christmas when God comes to earth as Jesus, an Israelite. He helps them and he shows them mercy. When we hear this in Mary's song, we can see the joy that this produces. She's elated about this fact because now she knows. Soon all Israel will know that God hadn't given up on them because of their sin. God hadn't given up on them because of, of their disappointment. Even though they had struggled, even though they had rebelled against him, even though there are times in their history, in their life as a people that they should be really ashamed of. God doesn't say, I've had enough of you. God doesn't say, you're out of rope. God doesn't say, you've had too many chances. God says, I'm going to be merciful to you and help you. Do you think God would tell you the same thing today? I believe that he will. One wonderful thing that we learn at Christmas in the Christmas story is that we're not too lost for God. If you've been through tough times, if you have experienced disappointment in your life, if you have experienced sin and disobedience to God in your life, and you've been through those and you've suffered those consequences, and you're at the other side of that and you're wondering, does God still want to help me? Does God still want to show me mercy? It, am I, do I mean anything to God or is, my, or is my rope out? Are my chances over? At Christmas and here in Mary's song, we learn that God wants to be merciful to you still. That your chances aren't over. That he wants to work with you. That, that there is an opportunity for everyone here in this room today, no matter what you've done wrong, no matter what you've been through, no matter the hurt you've experienced, to be in a good relationship with God. To join his redeemed people. To walk in a new life in his spirit. To be saved. God will help you. He will show you mercy. Your chances aren't over. Your rope isn't out. Now turning to verse 54. This is, the very, this is the last line of Mary's song. This is what she says. To Abraham and his descendants forever. So he's, shown, he's being merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Okay? The, she's saying that God now has fulfilled his promise. This mercy that he's showing to Israel is something he had promised all along. It's something that the Israelites had begun to doubt. They had spent centuries being oppressed by one nation after the other. Assyria, then Babylon, then Persia, then, then the Greeks, the Ptolemies, and uh, the, the Seleucids, and, the, and then the Romans. And it looked like deliverance was never coming. It looks like God's help was never going to be provided. It looks like all the promises that he made to him, made to, the, made to his people, weren't going to come true. But at Christmas, all that gets reversed. God himself becomes an Israelite. He's going to be faithful Israel in himself, and he is going to fulfill all these promises to Israel by sending his son Jesus to die on the cross for their sins and raise from the dead and be a king in the line of David forever and ever. God fulfills his promise to Israel. He does not let them down. His promises come true. This is the miracle of Christmas. The miracle is an astronomically improbable promise fulfilled. It looked like it wasn't going to happen. It looked like there was no hope for these promises that had been made so long ago. And people were starting to lose hope. People were starting to doubt. They would not trust. 
They were not trusting that God was going to deliver them, but all of a sudden, Jesus shows up in Bethlehem, and everything changes. All of a sudden, the promises can come true. There are so many people in our world today. There are so many of us in this room who refuse to trust God to fulfill his promises. Are you one of those people? Are you someone who trusts God to fulfill his promises? Mary's song ends with this truth, that God's promises come true. But are you the kind of person that trusts them? There are a number of promises in God's word about what we will experience, what kind of benefits that we get if we surrender our lives to Jesus and follow him. There are so many promises about what happens if we give our lives to Jesus. God promises to give us strength through his spirit in Ephesians 3. God promises to give you rest in Matthew 11. God promises to take care of your needs in Philippians 4. He promises to be with you always in Matthew 28. He promises to forgive your sins if you confess to him in 1 John chapter 1. He promises to give us everlasting life in John 3.16. God promises to give us a fulfilling life, life to its fullest potential in John 10.10. In Romans 8, he promises to make all things work for your good. And then he says that absolutely nothing not death or life or angels or rulers or present things or future things or powers or heights or depths or anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Those are all promises made to you. This morning, I want you to ask, are you the kind of person that trusts them? Are you the person who believes that God's promises will be fulfilled? Or are you like Israel before Christmas, doubting that God is ever going to come through for you? Let me tell you what it looks like when you don't trust God to fulfill his promises. Maybe that will clear it up. Maybe this will give you some idea of whether or not you're someone who believes that God's promises will be fulfilled or someone who, who's refusing to trust God. If you don't trust God to fulfill his promises, it might look like you refusing to live a holy life because you're worried that it won't be fun enough. It may look like you saying, God, I just can't give up this sin. I can't give up this wrong thing I'm doing because I'm worried that if I obey your words, if I, if I do what I know you want, then I I'm not going to be happy enough. I might lose the friends that I want to have. I might lose the social experiences that I want to be a part of. If you don't trust God to fulfill his promises, it may look like you not belonging to a congregation and worshiping with him on Sundays because you're afraid that your weekend will be too short if you do that. Or maybe your family will miss out on something fun that you could have done on Sunday instead. Or maybe if you don't trust God's promise uh, about worship and how it will change you if you give your life to him, maybe you'll think that on Sundays if you don't take your kids to practice or dance, then they're going to miss out on opportunities that will hurt their life or their experience at a, as an adolescent or as a kid. That's what not trusting God looks like. If you don't trust God to fulfill his promises, it may look like you pursuing relationships that you know are sinful, that you know God doesn't want for you because of fear that you won't be loved, that you won't have a companion, that you won't have the, the relationship with the person you want if you were to behave in a righteous way. If you don't trust God to fulfill his promises, it may look like you refusing to forgive someone because you're worried that justice won't be done and they won't get what's fair for the thing that they've done wrong. If you don't trust God to fulfill your promises, it may look like you neglecting your Bible and never opening it, maybe because you're worried 
that you won't understand what it says or because you're afraid that you won't have the time to do other things you enjoy. This is what it looks like to not believe God's promises will come true. Are you someone who trusts God's promises? Or are you someone who doubts that they're true? God promises us that if we give our lives to him and if we follow him, if we follow his son Jesus, that we will have a fulfilling life, that we will experience joy, that we will experience strength through his spirit, that our sins will be forgiven and we'll go to heaven. That is the path our life should be on unless we doubt that those words are true. Then we start to look in other areas. We look in other experiences for our joy. We look in other opportunities for our satisfaction. We look in, in other sources for security like wealth or greed or, or busyness. But the truth is that Christ is enough. That on Christmas, God's promises are fulfilled and we receive validation that our God fulfills his promises. And if you give your life to God, he will not let you down because at Christmas we learn that he always fulfills what he promises. That's the end of Mary's song. That's the soundtrack that starts out Christmas is this idea that God's promises to us will come true. God has promised you that if you give your life to him, if you will follow him, that you will find fulfillment. That you will not be disappointed or left behind or experience loneliness, unfulfillment, distraughtness. Those are, God promises us the opposite of that. And he invites us to, to try him out, to test his promises. And I invite you this morning to examine whether or not you're someone who has been believing that God's promises will come true or someone who has been doubting God's promises and trying to, to get those things in your own way. This Christmas season, I invite you to put your trust in God's promises and point your life in the direction of following him and trust that what he says will come true that the life he will give you when you do that will be fulfilling, will be more than you asked for, and will end with eternal life in, pres in his presence in heaven. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the incredible gift we received at Christmas of your son. I thank you for the testimony we saw today from our children here at church. Dear Heavenly Father, Help us to trust your promises. And God, when we're tempted to doubt you, when we're tempted to pursue uh, areas in our life, to pursue decisions and relationships and choices that disobey you, God, help us to remember to trust in what you've said. To trust in what you will provide when we lay down our life to follow your son, Jesus. Dear Holy Father, help us to be filled with Mary's song this Christmas. Help us to be people who are humble, people who are faithful servants, people to whom you show mercy, and those who trust your promises. We pray these things in your name.